लाइक दादी माँ लाइक स्मृति दादी माँ इट हैज नाउ बिन ओवर अ डेकेड सिंस आई लॉस माई ग्रैंड मदर आई कॉल्ड हर दादी माँ आई लिव मोस्ट ऑफ माई लाइफ इन द सेम हाउस विथ हर अलॉन्ग विद माई पेरेंट्स माई सिस्टर माई अंकल एंड एवरी अदर पर्सन शी ओपन द हाउस टू और हु केम इन एंड क्लेम द स्पेस I never met my grandfather. He died when my father was young. Dadi Ma must have been in her early 30s. I only saw a few photos of my dada and I knew precious little about him. The stories I heard from my older sister Sucheta painted a portrait of him as a spoiled rich man's son who made nothing of himself and enjoyed the finer things in life. His untimely death was caused by a heart attack he had upon receiving the news that the Mercedes he had just bought with my grandmother's money crashed on the way from Delhi to Bombay. He had taken possession of the car without getting its papers in hand, leaving him in no legal position to claim insurance. Under normal circumstances, this event should not have had the devastating impact that it did but the family was coping with the aftermath of the partition of india in 1947 dadima was born in amritsar current day india into a very wealthy household she got married at the very young age of 15 and moved to lahore current day pakistan to stay with her husband's family she gave birth to my father soon after and another son 3 years later when they started to sense trouble more than a decade later they sent the boys to boarding school in dehradun a place away from the eye of the storm they were hindus living in a city with that was soon to become part of the islamic nation but being wealthy they never imagined that they would be forced to leave their home and had no intention of doing so themselves and yet one night they looked outside the second floor window of their house and watched an angry mob coming down the street fortunately that night the crowd turned at the intersection of where their home was situated and went in the other direction The next day they left Lahore fearing for their lives. Smriti My name means remembrance. I am my name. It is my personal curse and gift in equal measure. It is sometimes hard to live with the weight of the past that I carry. The memory project was born out of an attempt to free myself of the burden of the distant past so as to concern myself with the new present the life i am making for myself in england with my british spouse matt never has a more naive hypothesis lived of cities of home the bangalore i grew up in was slow green and kind My childhood was spent walking the neighborhood of Indranagar, cycling and playing versions of games that faintly resembled cricket on 100 feet road where we lived. That white house, 838A, was the center of my universe. I loved going out of the house. Any opportunity to step step outdoors was a chance to smell flowers. taken the color and sounds of a never tiring world russell market to buy mangoes johnson market to buy meat lal bag botanical gardens the toy train in cabin park next to the aquarium next to the police station commercial street for shopping for clothes shoes school bags and the best jalebis bangalore club for its swimming pool children's play area and library Rex Cinema for the occasional movie, a circus in town at Palace Grounds, Mama's office, Papa's office, all the houses of everyone they knew, every garden, every empty plot was just waiting to be discovered. 
I have never been to Lahore. I have now been living in London for over six years. I've had to start making a life from scratch and it has not been easy. This city is teaching me a lot about itself, about art and about myself. London is hard and kind at the same time. I have dreams for the future of finding and making a place as much home as Bangalore has been. Papa and Dadi Ma had never been to London. The city of my childhood exists only in memory now. The house is gone and with it went the life it harboured. The memory project is about remembering home. Likeness. Soon after I got married, Papa was diagnosed with cancer. It was aggressive and we lost him just a few short months after. Dadima had already lost her younger son, Papa's younger brother, almost a decade before then. No mother should have to live past her children. It is the weight of her losses that I carry to this day. She lived through partition that forced her out of her marital home. She lost her husband early in life and supported all her siblings as she was the eldest of them alive. To know this history and then to see her lose Papa, her firstborn, was absolutely devastating. She passed away less than two months after he did. I witnessed a little over a third of her life. The rest I learned of through stories and through the physical residues that remain. We all knew Dadima to be a very strong woman. She was the matriarch of the family and was kind and generous, but firm. I live with the fragments of her life story. In experiencing loss, I learn more about hers. She lived her life with grace and I would like to process my memories of her with the same fortitude. Time. For a long time, I had wanted to record my grandmother's story of partition. When they fled Lahore, they lost all of the family's wealth, their house, properties, money and belongings. Everything except for her jewellery. They were able to make a new life from selling some of her precious possessions. My sister says that my great-grandfather, Babuji, had a penchant for buying jewellery from royal families who were looking to liquidate their assets. I grew up listening to fragments of these stories. A great-grandfather who was a landlord and had his favourite horses fed from silver buckets. In the puja room of our house, there was a black and white framed photo of Babuji impeccably dressed, the very definition of dapper, in a tailored black sherwani, white churidar, black jutis and black topi. These stories of her rich past were unfathomable to me at the time, as our reality of a very average middle-class life was so far removed from the pictures she painted. We grew up stable, but have been witness to financial pressures on my parents for most of our childhood. I never found the courage to dig deeper into her survived past. My hesitation was fueled by a sense that she might not want to remember. But I can say with certainty now that it was my own fear of taking on her past that scared me more. There was a part of me that was very comfortable with knowing her life as I had witnessed it. That was what I knew firsthand and that was enough. And enough it shall have to be as those questions will remain unanswered forever. Of things of us. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. 
Dadima, Papa and Ma, all hoarders. I am a hoarder too. This is my inheritance. We are twin fruit. Twin fruit we are. Matt and I moved back into my childhood home after Dadima's passing. This was eight short months after our wedding and setting up home in a rented house in Yelahanka, closer to the institution we both taught in. After Dadima passed away, Mama found herself alone in the house and I could not leave her to grieve alone, nor myself. In the four years that Matt and I lived there with Mama, we spent many a weekend slowly sorting through all the things in the house. We started with Papa's belongings, moved on to Dadima's, and then to all the storage spaces of the house. A loft in the puja room, things in the pantry, the staircase leading to the terrace, the garage, and then every small drawer in every piece of furniture. There were nine trunks that had not been opened in decades. Of this house that was lived in by them for over 40 years. This activity of sorting, giving away and getting rid of things was necessitated by the fact that we had put the house up for sale. I remember that in the year 1999, Papa had seriously considered selling the house and moving into a quieter lane of the same locality. We even went house hunting, but stopped abruptly when Dadima told Papa that she did not want to move. We never spoke about it again. When Papa first bought the land that the house sat on, his friends joked about him moving to the boondocks. When the house was built, there was just the post office down the road, a house diagonally across from us, and a small convenience store in the opposite direction to that of the post office. Over the years, the road we were on changed drastically. The roundabout near the local police station turned into a traffic light junction. This was when the road was opened up by the partial clearing of the slum towards the post office. Traffic increased significantly and then the footpath shrank in width to accommodate the metro that ran past the front of our house. From being a completely residential neighborhood with broad boulevards and scant traffic, it had become a main thoroughfare that now joins a ring road connecting the city to the suburbs. This changed the zoning of our property and the street soon got classified as commercial. The change was slow at first, a bank close by, then a restaurant, soon shops selling clothes, and in a span of a short decade, we became one of the handful of residential buildings left. 100 Feet Road is at least two kilometers long. It wasn't pleasant living there anymore. We found ourselves surrounded by commercial establishments, offices, and with three loud pubs for neighbors. The road was obscured by a relentless stream of slow-moving traffic for most part of the day. It was noisy, polluted, seemingly more unsafe, and went from being mildly irksome to becoming completely unpalatable. So Cheta had already made her life in America, and Matt and I had plans to move to England. The house was too big for Mama to look after and live in alone. It was time to move on. I learned from one of Papa's friends that he had confided in him about the inevitability of having to deal with the property. I believe that this is one thing Papa regretted leaving us to deal with on our own. When Ma fretted, as did I, over the mountainous difficulty of dealing with real estate, I would tell her and myself to consider this house a gift from Dadima, from Papa. Like Dadima, like Smriti.
With this work, I make peace with a trunk full of Dada's clothes that Dadima had put away in the loft. I imagine she put off dealing with them as her emotional strength was required elsewhere. I learned a little bit about him, a man I never met. Going through his clothes made me wonder what kind of person he was. I don't think I know anyone who has so many three-piece suits. In the pockets we found curious ephemera, a bow tie, labels of tailors, a ticket that could barely be deciphered, a note in the same predicament. Making this video was a way of recording those clothes before letting them go, with a childlike approach of playing house as an adult, of employing imagination and embodiment. It is pure coincidence that the still frame that we composed to shoot the video and where we placed the trunks were right next to a painting I had made of a house when I was just seven years old. The unfolding of the clothes in the video was also in the exact order as they were stored, with only one coat of Dadima's surfacing at the very end. I know it belonged to her because it fit me. Of endings. Papa's and Dadima's death marked the end of life as we had known it. I still mourn Dadima's loss of Papa more than my own loss of both of them combined. The memory project in large part is an active act of remembering them beyond the last few months of their lives, which as I witnessed, were very, very hard. I refuse to let the memory of this last struggle overpower 33 years of my life with them. I love my family profusely. This project is an act of love, an act of refusal to accept sadness as the story or as the end. It demands of me an emotional will that I sometimes doubt I have. And yet I have known that strength before and I will find it again. We gave away all the clothes in the trunk. The house was sold a short while after the video was shot. We had moved to England. Mama moved to an apartment. The house is now completely gone. In its place is a big commercial four-story building. The two coconut trees and the teak tree have been cut as have all the plants. There is not a trace of our house left except for the number assigned to the property. The project is about grieving, letting go, deciphering deep imprints and a conscious choice in the endeavor to never forget.